morning. Good morning. Good morning. Certainly we are glad to be back in the house of the Lord once again. Amen. Amen. Uh, on this cold Saturday morning. <laughs> but the Lord is still good. Yes. Amen. 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 Uh, it's an honor to be here this morning. Certainly to be in the presence of these teachers and certainly we got Brother Davis with us this morning. Amen. Amen. Come out and support his boot. <laughs> Amen. And so we are grateful. Amen. I thank God for it. Sister Kane is always stepping in and being and uh, what we consider the captain's chair. We certainly thank God for her. Uh, I'm trying to get her permanently here. She, she, I don't think she realized it yet. <laughs> and I become the fill-in person. <laughs> but we certainly thank God for her and her spirit. And thank God for our teachers. Amen, Sister Williams, on last week. And we know this week, uh, Brother Wright, uh, it's his day, but he has uh, some things going on. And so it's always good to just be prepared. So this morning, Sister Davis is willing to step in. Amen. Amen. And so we're going to uh, help her as much as possible, uh, even though she don't need no help. And we know she don't. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so we're going to pray. And then the next voice you're going to hear, that's going to be that of Sister Davis. Amen. Father, we bless you, God, and we give you honor and glory on this day. For this is the day that you've made, and we shall rejoice and be glad therein. Father, we thank you that you have kept us all week long, God, through danger seen and unseen, God. Your grace and mercy showed up. Father, we realize that the enemy had a plot and a plan, God, but you had a purpose. Yeah. And because of that, God, we are still here. Thank you for the assignment, God. Lord, we understand today, God, it's because of you that we breathe, move, and have our very being today, God. We just want to tell you thank you. Thank you, God, that even in inclement weather, God, that when ice is on the highway, God, you are still yet in control. Yes. Father, you guide and lead us, God, because it's you that's ordering our steps, God. And we thank you for it, God. Even when it's cold out, God, we realize, God, that there's something warm on the inside that's called the Spirit of God that lives on the inside of us. And because of that, God, we said thank you this morning. Father, we pray this morning, God, that your will will be done. And Father, we ask that you help us this morning. Speak, Lord, like only you can. You, Sister Davis, like only you can to fulfill your purpose this morning. And Father, we'll be careful to give your name praise and glory in this place. Father, don't let us leave the same way we came. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Well, this morning's lesson is entitled, We Are God's Handiwork. Yes. Amen. Yes. And even though we are uniquely made differently, we are all his handiwork. And it takes, as Brother Terry used to say, it takes all kind to make up the world. Mm. Amen, somebody. Yes. And so this morning, uh, we are now in the hands of our teacher of the hour. Amen. Sister Davis, amen. Morning. Good morning. Thank you. Come on, Sister Dave. I didn't <clears throat> hear you this morning. Okay. Um, okay, we're still we're in the book of Ephesians. All right. And so I was going to say a little bit about Paul and a little bit about Ephesus. All right. Paul, we know, is um, he was a Benjaminite. He was a Pharisee. He was uh, a Roman citizen from the province of uh, Tarsus. He was Paul of Tarsus. Um, we know he was considered, he's still considered like an apostle because apostles were those who had encountered Jesus in some sense, and he did on, on, the, on the Damascus Road. Um, we know that he was a tent maker, um, that he made uh, a few missionary journeys, and he wrote this uh, book of Ephesians while he was imprisoned on, well, he had like a, like a house arrest on one of his uh, 
that he had encountered, he went to a lot of the churches, like he wrote, I think, 13 epistles, but a lot of the epistles, a lot of the uh, churches he started, this was not one that he started. We think that it might have been um, Aquila and Priscilla that, that started this. They were fellow tent makers, fellow Jews, that he had befriended. And um, let's see what else on him. We'll go into a little bit about um, Ephesians, the, uh, the, the town Ephesus, which is now, is, is no longer there, but it, if it, the space where it was at would have been Turkey. And this, during his time when he was writing to them, he, they were followers of, I think they named it like calling it the way, but they follower, there were several followers in Ephesus that had started joining um, had become Christians, mm -hmm. had become saved. And, but this town, a bustling town, was filled with a lot of witchcraft, sorcery, idolatry. And um, so he had, a, he had a, a task in front of him. But Paul was very tenacious. Whatever you gave him assignment for, when he was on the side of, before he became a Christian, when he was on that side, like a, a Jewish Pharisee, and he was traveling along, he was very much, whatever he was doing, he did it to the fullest. Mm -hmm. He was a very good soldier. Mm -hmm. um, and so him trying to um, gain uh, people over for win souls for Christ, he was very tenacious in doing this too, to the point that the people that were um, idol makers, they were angered with him that he was so, so good, he was pulling their people away. This was what they made their source of money, that they made a lot of money out of selling idols, and people were turning away, and even in, a lot of this is in Acts, I think about 18 or 20, a lot of them had burned up their books, and they had stopped um, doing their things. Uh, they turned over to Christ. Mm -hmm. So they had even come to a point where they were revolting, and uh, Paul had wanted to go there because he didn't back down on anything but people prevented him from. And so also, um, last week, we know that from um, Sister Maul, that we were redeemed by God's grace through the blood of Christ. Um, when we hear and believe in the gospel that Jesus died for our sins, he resurrected, he conquered death, and he's seated at the right hand of God, mm -hmm. and we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit is a guarantee of our future, our future heavenly hope. And we have eternal security that true believers in Jesus for salvation can never be separated from the love of God. All right. Um, I was quoting parts of Romans 8, 37 to 39. Um, Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 15 to 23 highlights Paul's thanks and prayers. If you know the first one, Ephesians 1, 1 through 14, if you look at it in King James Version, it's like, one long sentence, um, and 15 to 23, the prayer is like this one long sentence. And he wants his readers to understand how great and powerful the gift that we got, that God has bestowed upon us, that Jesus is our ruler, that he's above all things, that he's head of the church, and that we are the body of the church. So I'll stop right there, because that was a part that I had for summary for from last from last week. All right. No, no, no. Okay. Just get into the lesson. Okay. Um. So we'll start off with we're putting together and notice the unit that we're in. It says we are God's artwork, mm -hmm. and with this particular lesson is we are God's handiwork, meaning we are. We are precious to him. In one part, I was reading in some place, we're like um, a diamond, uh, a special diamond that he put, or a, pe a special masterpiece mm -hmm. that he made, because we are very precious to him. And he wants everyone to come to him. That it's, it's us that's putting up the barriers, but he wants everybody to come to him. So um, Ephesians, second chapter, starting off in one to three, um, I'm reading from King James Version. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, 
wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. <coughs> okay, um, we'll start like with that first verse in one. When he says, have he quickened, quickened means he brought them back to life. And they were dead because when you're, even though um, like somebody could be rich and things, those things that they're getting are uh, like temporal when you don't have God in your life. So people were, we were living in the world, which uh, I don't want to get too far ahead because I think that's in the, uh, another verse. But we're living after like lustful desires. But, um, and there was something else too that we stopped on where he were dead in trespasses. And I was looking up like the definition like with trespasses because you see all the time no trespassing, no, um, no crossing here, no trespassing. And so it's meaning someone has gone the wrong way. You've lost your way. You've gone in the wrong direction. And just like if you're trespassing on somebody else's property, you're going in the wrong way. You're not supposed to be on somebody else's property. Mm -hmm. So he's made people alive who were formerly dead and trespassing in sins. And those are people who are not part of the body of Christ that we talked about last week. They were, you were living, even though you can look at people and uh, this person is rich, they have this, they have that, but they don't have Jesus. So they are, they're, they're dead. And it's not um, an in-between thing. People are either, you're in Christ or, or you're not. And um, it goes on to, in times past, you walk according to the course of this world. So you are worldly, and we know that the one that's in charge, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience, they're talking about Satan when they say that, that that's who's in charge of this world. So in essence, either you're walking with God or you're walking with Satan. You know, there's like, there's like, no in between. Um, what else that one or two? So there's, you have death, I wanted to address that. You got death where the soul and the spirit have been separated. But we have a chance for those of us who are in Christ that that's not a permanent death. The permanent death is when you are separated from God, when you're no longer, you're no longer with him, when you have, um, it's a spiritual death, a spiritual and moral death, when you're separated totally from him. Um, and also, let's see, what else do I want to? When you're living in the world, you're living without recognition and respect for God when we're caught up with things of the world. And that's, that's the, the spiritual death. And when we're living, um, I don't know, I had put this in here for me to remember about John 10.10, 10, that when you're living in the world, you're living according to like, you're being led by Satan who only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So you're, you're not living in the way that that God wants you to. And so when he, with these first verses he's going over, he's telling us of how the bad things were before he came and, and made us alive and turned us around. And that, that was our nature, being children of wrath, our nature following desires of the mind, desires of lust, and desires of want. So I think that's pretty much all, all I have for them. All right. Uh, so it's Rachel. Sister Williams, did you have your hand up? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Oh, Sister Rachel. Oh, when you were talking about that, it, it just popped into my head like uh, the, the parable of the lost son that when he was like, um, he went out to a world and spent his inheritance. And when uh, living in the world of sin and, you know, kind of depart from Jesus because he wanted the world, but he realized that that wasn't meant for him when he was eating like the you know the foods like of the pig and he came back to his father and realized he was 
supposed to be, um, I'm trying to put it in the right way, living the world of God, that he was apart from God living in that world of sin. I'm sorry, I just no, no, my I, I, I got you. He, he, uh, uh, you talking about the prodigal son when he left home and, and went out uh, to a foreign country and, and he squandered all of his, his blessings. Uh, that's kind of how it is when you have walked away from uh, the relationship you have with God. But God is, you know, Jesus is a great example of the, of the prodigal son's dad because he's still standing there waiting on him with outstretched hands. <coughs> and that's how Christ has done for us because the Bible said that it's his desire for none to perish, uh, but all to come to a place of repentance. And, and so when we look at uh, chapter 1, chapter 1, uh, we see the Father had chosen us. Not only had he chosen us, then the Son gave his life for us. Then also we see the mark of the Holy Spirit. Then we see the prayer. But then when we get to chapter 2, we see our past life. And this is what God has done for us. It's a reminder to us how far God has brought us. It's a reminder to us how far the Lord has brought us because sometimes, because we've been in church so long, we forget what we really came from. That's why sometimes it's hard for people to really think about his goodness and all the things that he's done because you know what? We have been going through the motions and we have forgotten that we ain't always been saved. We ain't always been under the Ark of Covenant. We were out in a world that if God had have said, said so or allowed, we would have died in our sins. But the Bible said that, that yet while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So in verse 1 it says, you have been quickened, made alive. That's what Christ did for us. He made us alive. Because guess what? When you're in sin, you're really dead. That's why the Bible said, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So Christ did that when he died for us. He quickened us who were dead in their transpass, transpasses, trespasses and sins. We were dead in our sins. But Christ quickened us. How did he quicken us? When he died and then we got the spirit of God that lived on the inside of us. We were quickened. We were quickened through the Holy Spirit. That's what brought us back to life. It's like being on the table. And it's a cold blue. And they come in and shock you back to life. That's what the spirit did for us. Brought us back to life. Because when we were in our trespasses, uh, trespasses, I don't know why I'm struggling with that word this morning. Uh, we were on our way to our, to our grave. Trespasses. Because it means in the Greek, it means not only a sin, but it means misdeed. A deviation from the truth. So we had walked away from, or yet came to the truth. Or accepted the truth. But then when we heard the word of God. Something happened in us. Because the word of God is the word of truth. That's why the Bible said. That faith comes by hearing. And hearing the word of God. Something happened when you heard the word. Something happened in your spirit. Caused you to be quickened. Leaving a life of deadness. Now all of a sudden having a life where now you are alive and living and vibrant. Now you have peace in spite of storm. You can be happy in spite of what's happening around you. You can have joy unspeakable no matter what's going on because of what's going on on the inside of you now. So you've been quickened. Anybody else? Day. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, for 
4 through 7, they um, put those together. Okay. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ. Mm -hmm. By grace you, ye are saved, and have raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we go back to that and we're saying when you're saying that God is rich in something. It's like he's letting you know it's not going to be we only got so much grace and this is going to run out. Or I only have so much love and it's, that's it. Or like um, how some religions believe that it's only a certain amount of people that's going to be there and that's it. That no, he is rich. He has it's enough to go around for everybody. He is rich and mercy. And um, in our Sunday school book, it was going about that, well, saying that if there was no wrath, there would have been no justice. And that the same entity, God, can give both Jesus uh, met a couple of requirements. It, he brought justice and he brought grace. All these things through his, his death. That he could be both righteous and gracious, both just and merciful. Um, that's from our um, like our Sunday school book. And also, I had written, I wanted to look at that in um, it's Romans 325, and it was someplace else. I want to say it was Colossians for this. Oh, Colossians 2.13, but Romans 3.25, because I thought that that really sort of would have said a lot. Now, th my version that I'm reading from is uh, a chicken soup Bible in Romans 3.25. For God sent Jesus to take the punishment for our sins and to satisfy God's anger against us. We are made right with God when we believe that Jesus shed his blood, sacrificing his life for us. God was being entirely fair and just when he did not punish those who sinned in former times. So, in essence, that was just reinforcing that he was both gracious and justice, and then brought justice. And... It was the other one that I was looking at was Colossians and Colossians 2 and 13. Colossians 2 and 13, and here again reading from, this is a chicken soup uh, Bible book. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins. 14, he canceled the record that contained the charges against us. He took it and destroyed it by nailing it to, to uh, nailing it to Christ's cross. And when you think of all of that and all that he did for us and how formerly dead, brought back to life, that, you know, that's a great feat there. Nobody, no other entity can do that for you. And he did this for us. So that was like, this is part of four through seven. And then he raised us up with Christ and seated in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus. In essence, when, when we're accepting him, our old self dies. And we, like, when we communicate with him, like when you communicate through the Holy Spirit, you're communicating on, on the heavenly realm, that we're going to, we're reigning with him. We are the body. We are the church, but we're the body part of the church and he's, He's the leader. He's the top. He's the head. Um, and that's one thing that our Sunday School book on page 101 wants to stress that, that this is both now and in the future. The resurrection is both present and in the future. Salvation is both present and in the future uh, for, for our standings for now. So, that's <laughs> Anybody got anything they want to add? Did you read six? Did she read? Did he? She hasn't got to six yet. Oh. Yeah, no, no, no. She's she, just. Let's see, what did I go? Four through seven? And, go, go ahead. I mean, if you had something. 
because I thought I was going four through seven, but let's see. Go ahead. Oh, Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I was looking at six and said, and has raised us together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And you was talking about how it's both present and future. So I was I was thinking about that when I was reading uh, the verse. How he, how he, uh, how he, when when he can have things in in the scriptures, both present and future. I was I was reading. Oh, I can't find it now. Oh, okay, go ahead. I I come back to that because I can't. Well, one of the things that I see uh, in verse verse two is we before we came when we came to Christ, we were under a different leadership, and that leadership that we were under at that time still exists today because he is the Prince of Air. He is still active. His name is Satan, which means that we have to stay active in the role that we are now as children of God. And so the Amplified, I like how it reads because it says, in which at one time you walk habitually, you were following the course and fashion of this world. That's why Paul lets us know when he tells us, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means that there has to be a change in our walk, our talk, there has to be a change in every aspect of our life once we come to Christ. So he says that uh, you will follow in the course of fashion of the world. We're under the sway of the tendency of this present age following the prince of the power of the air. You are obedient to and under the control of the demon spirit that still constantly work in the songs of disobedience, the careless and the rebellious and the unbelieving who go against the purpose of God. So that lets you know that Satan is still busy. We are part of the fortunate ones who have obeyed Christ and came into the body of Christ through Jesus Christ and what he did on, on the cross. Verse 3 says, among these, we as well, as you once lived and conducted ourselves in the passion of our flesh. So it's letting us know, Paul let us know, that there was a time when we lived that way. Amen, somebody. Amen. We lived that way at one time. But we thank God for Jesus. Thank God for his blood. The blood still works. It still has power. Because guess what? Even though we've been saved a number of years, we still have tendencies where we slip up. But we thank God for Jesus because now that we're in the family, we have an advocate that stands in the gap for us. That when we do make mistakes, it's not detrimental. Because God is a forgiving God. Somebody help me. Yes, ma'am. I like what you're saying because we have to think about the word grace. See, God's grace and mercy we have been saved. So even though Paul did bad when he was a Pharisee, God saw goodness in him. And he, because of his grace and mercy, he woke up Paul into, into his family. And by God showing Paul grace and mercy, Paul was able to be a disciple, apostle, to show grace and mercy to other Christians. And that's what we're supposed to be doing, showing God's grace and mercy of love. And um, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but you were talking about in this world, by us, we have to become new creatures. And that's one part of the things to do is showing grace and mercy right now. And be
being disciples and being on fire for Christ. Amen. I don't know if it correlates with the lesson, but that's what came to me. We're talking about being God's handiwork. We are God's handwork. And we had a formal life, a past life, that Christ died for us. God had a plan, sending his son to the cross. That helped adopt us into the family. Now we are a part of the family. And Paul is just pointing out the fact of where we came from. He's reminding us that you ain't always been where you are right now. This is where you came from. There was a time when you was just disobedient as the folk that are still out in the world. But now, because when you get to verse 4 through 6, he begins to talk about our present life. But God wants to forgive people. He loves us so much that he gave us, gave each of us a new life in Christ goes from talking about where you once were to where you are now. Thank God for Jesus and the grace that he's extended to us. God is patient. God is love. God is long-suffering. He has a lot of characteristics that we're still working on. Anybody else? Just can you lay back back there? You got nothing to say. <laughs> okay, I, I know when we're when we're changed, we're supposed to change naturally and spiritually. And that that verse six mm -hmm. is the one that I was talking about, and mm -hmm. has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places mm -hmm. in Christ Jesus. So. I had a coming and a question kind of mixed in together. All right. Uh, he made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Uh huh. And I know believers are, we are spiritually in heaven. Mm -hmm. Spiritually. We're yeah. not naturally in heaven right now, but we are spiritually in heaven by being changed spiritually. Mm -hmm. But naturally, we're still here on earth. All right. So, by us being a spirit, being placed in heaven spiritually, that's what I want to explain. How are we placed in heaven spiritually? Because we are connected to Him. Okay. Spiritually, we have God's spirit. God's spirit is connected to to God. So when Christ, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, because I was trying to get back to chapter 1. For some reason, my computer is not acting right. There we go. <clears throat> uh, all right, there it is. Chapter 1, verse 10. And it says that in the disp dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So because we're in Christ, mm -hmm. spiritually, okay. he's seated at the right hand. That means that spiritually, that's where we are. We're connected to heaven. Okay. But we haven't arrived there yet. Physically, no, we have not. No. Spiritually, we are. Okay. That's why when, when you... And this is not even trying to be deep, but this is just keeping it 100. That's why when your spirit man is leading you, you're in a better per a place peacefully when things are going awry. You, 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 you can then see the scripture and, and it has an effect that says, I know all things are going to work together for the good. Mm -hmm. You can run and shout because you read Ephesians 3 and 20 and say, you know, uh, he can do exceedingly abundantly above all because spiritually we get excited because that's what the word is. The word is spiritual. But in our natural state is where we struggle. 
Because we are still here on earth. That's why he says everything that we need, we've been given spiritually. Meaning everything that we need is already been given to us in heaven. We just have to wait on it to manifest. But we have to believe through faith that it will manifest. If I'm waiting on healing and I'm praying for healing, then I have to believe through faith that God is going to heal my body. No matter how long it takes, I've got to believe. Because when you go to Hebrews chapter 11, it deals with our, our faith heroes. And the text says that a lot of them did not receive what they were waiting for, even though they saw it afar off. But they never liked in faith. So that's why it's important spiritually that we constantly feed our spirit man. That's why devotion is, 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 is good. Get up and read devotionally. Read your word. Stay in prayer. Because that helps build your spiritual man. And the more you build your spiritual man, the more that you can endure. The more you believe. The more you decree over your life. The more you speak positive versus negative. Because you understand the effect that words have. Hopefully that helped you. Yeah, that did. If I go back to in chapter one when you were saying like how we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. That's okay. I also I was thinking back with um, when he's when in our verses that we're going over now, and he was explaining what we have in store for us. For what we have now, that's probably why when we're not in him, we're not feeling a sense of peace. And it took me back to, it was a, um, a co-worker I used to work with. And every few months, she would have um, something that she had as a goal. And she said, okay, now my goal is this um, diamond bracelet that I have to have. Mm. And then once she had the diamond bracelet, I was like, so... Are, are you happy now? No. I, it's, it's this particular car that she had to have. And it was always, it was, you know, a goal like every few months for something that she had to have. And now when I'm looking back, and I'm not saying that I've been any better or anything, but it, it just stood out to me as a good example of that you have lust of the world and things and you're not finding an inner peace because you're always searching for that next thing. And you'll find everything that you're looking for in Christ. But because you're, you know, like, I got to get this, I got to get that, I got to have it like this, that, and that, that's part of what I was getting out of the verses here, that our peace and everything that we wanted, and I think Pastor just addressed that, that, everything they could see from afar, everything that they wanted, everything that you need is there in him. Let, let me read something real quick. Uh, okay. And it says... We don't sit in heavenly places with Christ, or at least not yet. Instead, we sit in the heavenly places in Christ, Jesus. Since our life and our identity is in Christ. As he sits in heavenly places, so do we. And now we sit in heavenly places. We have a right to the kingdom of God. Anticipate this glory and are indescribably happy in the possession of this salvation and in our fellowship with Christ Jesus. So because we're in Christ, we're seated. There you go. There you go. There you go. Absolutely. But spiritually, because we're in him, we are already there. In spirit and in truth. And then the, the word lets us know that whatever we decree down here on earth shall be released in heaven. Because there is a connection with us in the heaven. Whatever you bind, guess what he says? It's already bound. Whatever you loose, is already loose. Because of your connection. 
when you're saying whatever you bind or lose, that's everything that you've already attained? When you bind something, that means that you are rebuking it. Oh, okay. God moves on, on your behalf, and he counsels it out. Okay. So whenever I release, whatever I loose, whatever I decree, God, because I'm a child of the king, God releases. Let me see if we did verse 7 of where that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. I think we did sort of cover that. That, well, he's saying that although we're there in him, in spirit, that in the ages to come the riches of his grace is back to the things of him having exceeding grace that he has so much it overflows in his kindness to us because of Jesus' sacrifice for us. That we'll, it says, I had this one paragraph here from this one book, that in the ages to come, those who have been seated in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ, as Pastor was saying, will see the exceedingly great riches of his grace. I forgot to get that uh, passage of where how eyes have not seen ears have um, not heard. and ears have not heard. We can't even encompass all the things that we have that's coming to us. And that's what I thought about with this one, that we can't even, there's no way we can think in our little, our limited minds of everything that he has so great for us. That when it says exceedingly great riches of his grace, of his unmerited favor that we gain through our faith in Christ. Not only will believers see God's grace, but they will also experience his kindness through Jesus Christ. And that's all I have for seven. If anybody had any comments on seven. When um, reading the lesson for eight through ten, it was, I can't remember if it was in the Sunday school commentary or the other one, that was stressing that eight through ten is the the like the big point, the highlight, um, one of the themes of what this lesson about being God's handiwork. And for eight through ten, eight is for by grace are you saved, are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so when you start back, we talked about earlier about what grace was, his unmerited favor, his, his love, his compassion toward us, that we're saved by that, not by something that each of us had done. Because if so, someone will say, I did this I did. and I did that. Yes. And so that's the reason why I'm here because I did this and that. Right. Or like how when we were talking about it at home, we talked about the parable of the lady who only put like um, uh, one, one pence, I think, or half a pence in. And all these other people were, look, I, I put in 500 pence or whatever it was. I might not be getting the exact verse of what they did, but Jesus brought to the attention that what she did was more than what all the rest of them did because of her giving her all. That you're not measured the same way, the things that you did. Or the other thing that um, I think Rachel was bringing up of how um, that one, like it was back to the same thing with the um, prodigal son. That the other son was mad when he saw his brother coming back was, look at what I did all, all my life. I've been good. And then here he goes, been gone all this time and comes back. That God's sense of measurement is not the same way as our sense of measurement. He wants everybody to come back. He welcomes you with open arms. Even if you're like the criminal that was on the cross that Jesus had welcomed into his kingdom that day. You know, as opposed to um, somebody who's been doing something all their life. He wants you to come. Even if you're just like coming, you sliding through right at the end, doesn't matter. He welcomes you. He welcomes you. He sees, he sees 
he doesn't have the same type of scales of justice that we have in our, in our system. Because if we were in charge, we would condemn a lot of people except ourselves. But we find a way to condemn everybody, practically, except ourselves. So that's when it's by grace you have been saved through faith. And that is not from yourself as the gift of God, not by works. And it, I'm trying to think if it was in here or... It's saying that it's not what Paul is teaching and what James are saying are contradicting themselves. Because James mentions by works, but when you get to a point that you're saved and grace and you have love, you're going to want to show that. But it's not a measurement of you that you're showing. It is because you're doing it out of love and out of what God has given you to show to others. You want to see others do well. You want to show the grace that's been bestowed upon you, but it's not making um, it's not making you better than anybody else. It's like that um, the saying. I think I first heard it with Jesse Jackson uh, years ago that if you're looking down on someone, you're only looking down to pick them up. Absolutely. That you don't look down to um, keep them down. You're just looking to pick them up. And then how every one of us. I think we said this earlier. You're a masterpiece. You're his workmanship. You're like a diamond in the raw. You're, you're everything to God because this is what he wants. He loves us so. He wants us to come back. But it is us that are, you know, we have this block, this barrier, the resistance and things. Or you're tempted by the spirit of this world who is Satan, but he wants us to come back. But we are his handiwork or his artwork. We are his masterpieces. Um, we were created to do good works. Now, let's make sure, like, when we're talking about James, James is not saying that works alone, uh, but what he's saying is, if I got faith, then I ought to have works to go along with my faith, because my works ought to show my faith. That's what James was, is letting us know. You know, it's one thing for me to say I'm a believer, but then I don't have no works to go along to show that. I don't have no compassion towards mankind. I don't, you know, so, so let's make sure that, you know, I don't want anybody to get confused to think, well, James is saying, no, you got to have works because Paul is saying here that it's nothing that we've done. We are his handiwork. Paul is just showing us the great work that God did. God had a plan. God had a purpose. Let me read something. It says, Paul now comes to the purpose of God's great, God's great power. He writes about the reason why God raised Jesus from the dead. He writes about the reason why he raised us with him. He did this to show for all time his rich grace. That word rich is abundance. God is abundant in everything that he has. Because he's not a resource, he's the source. That means, source means that's where everything begins, originates. God, God will never run out of anything. I'm going to say that again. God would never run out of anything. You know, I was during the pandemic when it started. We'd run into the, to the, to the, to the uh, grocery stores and certain things they was out of. You couldn't buy no tissue paper. <laughs> God will never run out of anything. He shows all time his rich grace. Nothing can compare with that. He showed this in the kindness that he showed to us in Christ Jesus. Then Paul comes back. And lets us know that God is the one that saved us. It ain't nothing that we did. We simply accepted the gift. Amen, somebody. Mm -hmm. That's all we did. We accepted the gift. What work did you do, sister? I see you over there with your wheels turning. <laughs> yes, ma'am. No, you said. What did you say? I said we. Then we simply accepted the gift. Right. I said by faith. That's it. That's it. Absolutely. All right. Go ahead. You know, I was thinking about how we are in the world and we're not of the world. Mm -hmm. But still, sometimes we let the world that doesn't know anything about living tell us what to do. Why is that? Say it again. We we, we, we let them. We let the world tell us what to do? Yeah. Probably because 
it's, it's, it's amazing how those who are not in Christ, they know the guidelines of, of what the word says. They just don't live by them. So now they judge you by what the guidelines say because you say you're a believer. Now, we shouldn't be judged by them because that's not what the word tells us. But we are judged a lot of times by folk that are outside of the body of Christ. Because they are the, they're the ones who say we are hypocrites if we fall astray or if we fall short. Because they feel like, guess what? You say you ought to live a certain way. I ain't the one to say I'm say I don't go to church. That's why the Bible said, let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. That's why the Bible lets us know, don't let your good be spoken evil of. If there's something <laughs> that you want to do, <laughs> you got to know when to do it and how to do it. Can't just do it out in front of everybody. I ain't telling you what to do. I'm just <laughs> I know it, but I'm just saying. Okay, for example, let's just say you uh you want to celebrate, you want to have a glass of wine. That ain't the sin. But having a glass of wine, I ain't telling nobody to drink. But I'm just saying, that's not the sin. But if I'm become an alcoholic, where now it's causing dysfunction in my family, I can't pay my bill. That's where the sin comes in. That's why the Bible said, "Lay aside every weight and sin," because weights are not necessarily sin, but they can become sin. But my weight may be a sin in somebody else's eye because maybe they don't drink at all. But me taking a sip and saying I'm saved, they may be like. Oh, you sinning. You're supposed to drink. We can debate that all day long. Yes, ma'am. I mean, you know, people are in a rush to point out our faults as Christians, but it's just like that song. It says a saint is just a sinner that um, falls down. And got it. But people really need to read their Bible. A lot of people that we call righteous in the Bible, they have their troubles. Like David, who was a man after God's own heart, even though he slept with an, another man's wife. But God still loved him, and he had his grace and mercy for him. So, and, and just another thing in the Bible, when God said, why, with that woman he was talking about, who was a prostitute, why are you guys judging her when you guys got a plank in your own eye? We, we really shouldn't be judging each other, but lifting each other up. People, and those people who are putting us Christians on a pedestal, we're not perfect. We're not going to be perfect until we receive our holy body in heaven in Christ. And the Christians who are trying to be perfect here on earth, that's just going to try to drive them crazy. And here's the thing. That's what we have to explain to people, though. Mm -hmm. You know, because people... Here's the thing. There's a misconception because some people try to make it seem like, as a Christian, I am... I am perfect. I am just this perfect Christian. No, you're not. Because if I look down on somebody else in judgment, un, in personal judgment, then I've already sinned. There's a judgment that is allowed within the body of Christ when it comes to somebody who is hindering the church. If there's somebody in here who is living in sin out in the open, and it is causing dysfunction in the church. The Bible tells us then we have to come together and put that person out so that it does not filter into other people in the body. But for me to just look at you and say because you don't live like I live and judge you that way, then I'm the one who is living in sin. Yes, ma'am. Short of the glory of God. He 
even though we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, guess what? We still sin. Bible said, righteous man falls seven times. Amen. Right. And he knew that we would sin. Absolutely. That's why he gives us mercy. Amen. It falls right in the face. Mm -hmm. But the ultimate will of God is that we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. Yes. Once we have set, accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have been, last week, adopted into the family. Absolutely. We belong to him. Yes. Now, because we belong to him, he has given us every tool that we need while we're here on earth. Right. Because he already knows what we're going to be dealing with. And every day, every one of us, me included, sin. There's no sinless person. We're still sinning every day. That's why we have his mercy. So when I was looking at this lesson, as it said um, in this book, God is an artist. When I started studying the lesson, I just pictured myself looking at God, drawing out my life on this canvas. And when he started drawing it, he was showing how I was. And as he was going, he said, let me perfect this. Yes. And he made some changes in that drawing. Yes. Amen. All right. And that drawing began to show where I'm going to end up. Because I had accepted him as my savior. Amen. Watch, watch this. Y'all were over there painting oh, not long yeah. ago. Uh -huh. When you started, some of y'all might have been like, oh, that didn't mean to do that. But by the time you finished, there you go. the piece came together. Perfect. And you was proud of it. And you was taking a picture with it. Amen. 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 He is an artiste. Uh -huh. And if he made us, because it says we are his hand to work. Yeah. We are perfect in oh, his yeah. sight. Even with our flaws, yeah. right. we're still perfect in his sight. Thank because God. when he looks at us, he sees the Thank blood of God. Jesus Christ. Right. The blood is what helps our perfection. Yeah. Wish I had yeah. somebody. Amen. I think we've covered everything. All right. <laughs> I think we've covered everything. I didn't have. As I said, I didn't know I was doing this, and I normally don't have a summary, on, even on the best of days, and I don't have anything else. But I think I was listening to, to uh, Sister Maul, and she was pretty much summing up the lesson here. Yeah, she, she just did. It. Look, yeah. it, it, it's like when Jeremiah showed up at the potter's house, and he's looking at the potter as he is forming the clay. And the Bible said that even in, in the potter's mind, he has an idea of how he wants the, the, the clay to come out. Right, right. And when the clay does not act right, even though it's in the potter's hand, yeah. the Bible said he just reshapes it back out again. Yeah. And sometimes in our life, God is just, does, he does us just like this. Yeah. It does not feel good. It hurts, but he is just moving out the rough place uh -huh. because he is making us into the image that he wants us to be. Which shows me that even though the clay is in the, in the potter's hand, sometimes it's still flawed. But guess what? The potter didn't stop. <laughs> Thank God today for us. Sister Dave is leading us in our lesson. Thank God for all the comments. Amen. Thank God, Sister Wynn, for getting us stirred up here. Amen. God is good and he is good all the time. And certainly we are grateful that we are God's handiwork. We, we are his architectural piece of work. He has chiseled us and made us into what he all, wants all of us to be. And we, even though we're all different, guess what? We're the same in Christ. Amen. And for that we are forever grateful. Amen. Thank you again, Sister Davis. Amen. Amen. Great job to be thrown in <laughs> at the ninth hour. <laughs> I know you had a lot of nerves today, and, but you know what? Uh, excellent job. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's pray so we can close out. Father, we bless you today, and we thank you for your word, God. We thank you that we are your handiwork, God. Father, we thank you that we were adopted into a family. And then, God, we thank you that you look past our past life, Father, and then you began to form our present life. And then you made a future life for us. 
God, it wasn't nothing that we did, but God, it was all your works, God. Yes. Because you sent a son of yours, God, your only begotten, to a cross on Calvary's hill. <clears throat> Die that we might have the right to the tree of life. Father, we thank you today. Thank you for what he did for, for what he did for us, God, over 2,000 years ago. But then, God, we said thank you for what he's doing for us right now. Yes. Father, we thank you, God, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Father, made in your likeness, God. Father, your uniqueness, God. Then, God, we thank you that the spirit of God lives on the inside of us. And for that, God, we're forever grateful. Father, we ask today, Lord, that you go with us, stand by us, lead us. And guide us. Father, give us traveling grace and mercy once again. Then, God, meet us here once again like you always do. And have thine own way, God. Father, in Jesus' name we pray. We all said amen. 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 All right, Sir Simmons, you are up.